Hello. What's happening? Sir, Mr. Shankar is there to join. I spoke to him. No, ask him to use the link rather than directly get into Zoom using yeah, the numbers. Yes. Yeah, ask that is what get, I use the link. That is what I told him. That is what I told him. Uh, is that he will he will do the needful. I think he was trying from his phone. He couldn't get through. So yeah, yeah. You need to use the link that you have shared. Correct. That will bring him as a panelist. Otherwise, he will attendees. Correct. Sir, Mr. Shankar. Yes, come, sir. Sir, audio is not ready. Sir, Mr. Shankar, sir, your audio is not ready. Sir, your 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 audio is not ready, sir, Mr. Shankar, sir. Your audio is your mic is not on. Ah, it has come. Uh, Shankar, you are muted. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Now it's okay. I will go ahead, sir. Live, sir. Thank you. I had some tech glitch. I had to resolve. Sorry. How are you today? Oh. I am fine. Um, great to see you. Uh, you know, so far away, but uh, now we seem very near. Okay. Uh, so let me introduce. Will uh, Ravi? We can start in like a minute. We can. We are already five minutes late, sir. We can start. We can go live. We are. Uh, we are live now. Okay. Lovely. Thank uh, you. Uh, Shankar, my suggestion is let's get an introduction. Uh, of course, if you want to say something to set the context, it's okay. But don't introduce me. Everybody probably knows me. <laughs> no, no. I have to introduce the show. That's all. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. This is uh, Shankar Ayer. It's 6.30 in India and 9 a.m. in North America. Join us on Indian Express Group's new initiative, Expressions. This is where we get experts, top uh, leaders to come and speak about a current uh, event issue. Today, our guest is Chris Gopal Krishnan, who needs very little introduction on either side of the Atlantic, having been the founder uh, member of Infosys and also uh, chairman and CEO of Axelor Ventures now. Uh, welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Indian Express Group. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the word unprecedented, I think, needs updation because everything is unprecedented just now. We are doing this show, which is unprecedented. There is uh, over three and a half million people infected, over nearly 300,000 deaths. Uh, we nearly three, two thirds of the eco world economy is under lockdown. We hear of a $10 trillion stimulus package. Everything is unprecedented and the uncertainty is unprecedented. So from your uh, vantage point, Chris, how do you look at this pandemic? Uh you know, clearly, as you said, uh, it's unprecedented, but I uh, refer to it as a once in a lifetime uh, event. Hopefully this uh, will not get repeated in our lifetime again. And, uh, and uh, I see the responses that are required uh, are from the lowest level to the highest level. What I mean by this is as individuals, we have to practice discipline. We have to be responsible. 
we have to make sure that we take care of ourselves we take care of our family the same thing then holds good for a state the state has to take care of its people and as a society global society we have to collaborate and we have to work together to take care of the situation so it's very interesting to see uh, we have an opportunity to really rethink how as individuals to as a world community we work in this uh, pandemic and i think it's a it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to rethink the models that we use as individuals to live as a community as a global community how do we work together that's an interesting point i mean you know uh, whether we need new collaborative platforms or we need to sort of update our existing collaborative platforms as a society as a democracy uh even within the family uh the the pandemic itself the science of it i just wanted to spend a few moments on that uh it defies definition uh there are countries which are affected there are cities which are affected not affected uh there are kinds of people which are affected we still don't know whether those affected get immunity and uh unlike the other epidemics uh, there is no clarity as if uh, as yet on the level of immunity antibodies in the system for a post recovery person so there are a whole lot of questions around this do you see india's response in terms of how they approached uh, the issue as adequate uh, could do better or inadequate how, how would you sort of uh, and i don't mean this necessarily as a political question as as a people how do, how are we responding to it uh, we will know for sure much later unfortunately mm-hmm. we are living through this every country is uh, responding slightly differently and the jury is out which is the best response um, we may probably never know which is the right response because you can't play this back or you can't and i hope we don't see this coming back again to test out our hypothesis so we are in real time making hypothesis and testing these out those countries which have used science to decide how they need to respond those countries that have listened to their scientists in responding maybe have a better uh let's say uh current status uh, in that sense india decided that given its poor infra- healthcare infrastructure given that uh, you know a lot of people um, are uh, living in um, smaller apartments or smaller dwellings or you know many people living in single room uh, facilities etc the lockdown would probably be the best way to uh, fight this and and buy time for us to prepare better and we had the strictest lockdown probably in the world it seems to have helped till now because per capita we have the lowest death rates and i would only really look at the death rates because life lost is life lost forever and and we have been able to save lives and in that sense uh, i would say till now our response has been um, right we have focused on lives rather than livelihoods now we are transitioning <clears throat> to livelihoods and here i think we will face some challenges because when it transitions to livelihood that discipline that we impose through lockdown is no more there we'll come we'll, I'll, i'll just want to sort of uh, hold your you to hold your thought there uh, so when we come to how india dealt with the issues and how other countries dealt with so the indian paradigm was defined by the density of population density of poverty density of uh, floor space uh, and the inadequacy of the healthcare structures i just finished writing a book Uh, on india's public uh, delivery services and we have 1 million doctors for a population of 1.3 right. billion and that i mean you know it's 
mind boggling how we are managing still. But there is a, a lot of discussion around how Germany has dealt with it, how Korea has dealt with it, how Taiwan has dealt with it, how, I mean, you know, and, and then of course the Swedish epidemiologist idea of <clears throat> pushing for immunity. Uh, the, some people believe that by the lockdown only pushes the curve to the right. Uh, it gives the, the state time to prevent disorder and uh, establish order and maybe a pause to build in capacity or whatever is needed. The contrarian theory, and of course, as you rightly said, in the absence of counterfactuals, we'll never know. The contrarian theory is that eventually India, in, the, in India and elsewhere in the world, people will get used to this. Uh, there will be a certain amount of ca casualty. The causality might be pre-existing conditions or age or whatever and uh, the world will move on. <clears throat> and in that sense, where do you stand on the argument of the cure being worse than the uh, illness argument that is there, particularly in North America, uh, in definitely in many parts of uh, India, uh, many people who are affected, uh, the businesses or their livelihoods are wondering about this question. So uh, there are uh, two parts to the answer. Uh, the first part, as you rightly said, we needed to buy time. You know, mm -hmm. this we were completely unprepared as the world was completely unprepared for this. And we had to buy time. And in that time, I think we have put together some response. Uh, and, and I think that was the right thing to do. I believe that was the right thing to do. And we have saved lives. And I, you know, the single measure I look at right now is that we have saved lives uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in this time frame. Now, of course, we are shifting to livelihoods to address this issue of, uh, you know, if we don't address the livelihoods, we can lose lives now for, um, you know, for, um, uh, you know, poverty and for uh, uh, not having food to eat and things like that. And so rightly, so we have addressed this, uh, we are starting to address the issue of livelihood. Um, the second part of the uh, answer is that, yes, still we have a vaccine, till we have a cure, um, this virus is going to be around. And so we need to define what is the new normal and train our people to, um, practice the new normal. So what I mean by this is after 9-11, if you look at uh, how the security infrastructure came into place, every building, you know, you go into an airport, we have a security infrastructure in place to prevent people from, um, you know, smuggling weapons and things like that, right? Uh, similarly, the new normal will be, everybody will be checked for temperature, you know, is there any, any, um, sign of a illness or something like that so that then we isolate the person we need to have a mechanism to do contact tracing and things like that that becomes the new normal uh, and and i hope that uh, in this time india has uh, uh, trained its people because ultimately till science comes in and helps it is the individual's discipline and practice that is going to save us uh, and if we don't do that, then uh, we will we will actually suffer because of that. And I hope that uh, we practice that. In developed countries, um, they are able to practice this much better. You know, if you, you talked about Korea, you know, because of the waves of um, pandemic that they have faced, the the population is practiced in doing that. Even in India, if you look at states like Kerala, they have actually done a much better job because they have actually faced uh, you know, all kinds of viral attacks and prepared the population to um, do some kind of a disciplined uh, ethic. And historically, uh, they've had a very good uh, healthcare system. That, that's very true. Uh, right. Kerala has been a uh, outlier in education and in health throughout uh, India's independent history. Uh, the, 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 the subject, uh, the point that you made about uh, how people changed after 9-11, uh, 
uh, after the terror attacks. And so frisking and the screening became normal. So I guess testing and tracing will be part of the aviation or travel uh, lexicon now, uh, in, in the sense that we, we probably might see even uh, an X-ray machine which sort of looks at people's, uh, just like in, if you enter the US, you go, you go through the body scan, there might be new right. ways. But uh, we will <clears throat> get used to all that. But uh, travel is still a far, uh, far distance away. And uh, I think the point that you made about societies being trained and disciplined and getting used to. So there is, there is a need for uh, a sociological acceptance or social acceptance of many uh, new ways to protect each other. Uh, yes, that's that's a very uh, valid point, and people not only have to take responsibility for their own uh, health, but also for the health of others. So uh, that that may actually improve our overall health indicators. Also, if one uh, the hygiene aspect sort of uh, comes in, uh, I, I I I think that I wanted to touch on one more part of this story, which is uh, what this is, what the lockdown is doing to uh, the mental health of uh, people. How, how are people looking at this? This is a huge anxiety, you know, uh, there are places in the world uh, which have been locked under lockdown for 60 days. We have been under a lockdown for over 50 days. Uh, there is the anxiety of being cooped in, 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 in smaller spaces or not able to move out. Uh, take a, a large part of your liberty is taken away. I mean, the interesting thing is, uh, I was just reading this yesterday. Thomas Hobbes wrote Leviathan, the idea of the state, uh, while uh, the plague was sort of uh, playing out in Britain and he, he his worry for uh, loss of order and chaos actually brought him to think about the order of the state. And a lot of liberty has been taken away by the state. You, they are telling you how to move, when to move, whatever. This is causing anxiety. There is also the economic anxiety, whether right. you have a job. And if you're distanced from your near and dear, that's a separate anxiety. Uh, how do you see this? I mean, you've done uh, quite a bit of work in this area. And this is one of your care and concerns. So I just wanted to sort of pause here before we went into the economic aspects of the new world. See, we have to look at uh, responses at multiple levels. So we have to address this issue of um, uh, livelihood. We have to make sure that people have food to eat, uh, a place to live. And uh, that was the response. And I'm extremely glad that many uh, philanthropists, many non-governmental organizations, NGOs came together and made sure that people were fed and people had a place to stay. Uh, the, the, most of the um, daily wage earners were paid salary uh, for some time. Now, of course, uh, you know, the, the companies will find it more and more difficult to sustain that. So one is to address this issue of hardship. The second is address this issue of uh, isolation. And we have to use technology. There is no other solution. And I'm very glad that the penetration of uh, uh, smartphones and um, uh, phones with uh, video capabilities increasing. Uh, even, uh, you know, I have seen that even, uh, you know, laborers are now very much used to using video on their phone to talk to their uh, uh, dear ones, I think we need to, you know, make that into a habit for which we need to make sure that bandwidth is available. So this definitely has, um, um, you know, shown us the need that in today's age, in the 21st century, bandwidth is actually one of the most important infrastructure requirements. And, and India has done a good job, but it could probably do even better. Uh, the third aspect is, um, you know, when it becomes a mental challenge. Uh, and again, you know, we unfortunately don't have um, the best of the infrastructures uh, when it comes to, um, you know, healthcare. Mental health is actually a taboo in society. Uh, we need to start uh, 
addressing this very carefully uh, as a society we need to be open transparent about uh, you know the need for addressing mental health issues and things like that um, uh, this actually had become a problem even before this when uh, you know the the family uh, structure itself had gone to uh, you know the uh, from um, from multi family this thing to single family etc uh and both husband and wife working children are not uh, uh you know with the parents most of the time they just come home and sleep yeah. so they spend very little time with parents so there are multiple of these issues and as a society i think we need to start addressing this issue of mental health and we don't even have mental health professionals in the country so all of these need to be addressed so uh, associated with this is uh the issue i mean you know a lot of people are avoiding testing those who are been tested uh, are worried because there's uh, like a lot of other uh, issues in society stigma about yes. being infected by covid has become a very serious issue uh, you you see stories news reports about people running away from care centers or not reporting or disappearing all of this is prob most of it is because of the stigma because suddenly they feel that they might be wrenched away from any help or the social networks that uh, enable them to stay fit how does one uh, how do corporates uh, and the government sort of look at uh, look at this and what can be done to address this the second is uh, a more critical aspect because uh, employees who are working from home employees who are unsure about their uh, jobs all of them what change do you would you like to see in hr practices in corporates to sort of uh, deal with this so one is how can the government ease the stigma aspect of covid infections and the, and the anxieties that follows and the second would be how do you deal with the anxieties uh, of a new how can you carve out or redesign hr practices for uh, employees at the corporate sector yeah so you know initially we had to use um, um fear um you know uh, we had to use um, uh, a a a um you know lockdown which is more stringent than that was probably necessary at that point to ensure that people don't venture out Uh, and that has created the stigma i believe um now that we are opening up we need to tell people um you know that was necessary for a particular reason now what is necessary is um, uh, social distancing wearing masks uh, cleanliness things like that i think we need to make those into habits and say that then this virus uh, uh, will will be controlled we can control this virus uh and we can keep our um, death rates etc in at manageable um, levels acceptable levels though no death is acceptable but you know we have to we have to kind of educate the population around that now there is a role for hr to play there is a role for um, uh you know industry leaders to play here again to tell people that uh, you know if you are tested positive nothing happens you get isolated you get quarantined uh, after 14 days 15 days whenever the 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 doctors tell you you can come back to work and everything is back to normal so we need to practice this we need to have examples right now this has been uh, a a a sudden thing right we didn't have time to mentally prepare for our prepare ourselves on this and that's what has really happened uh media has not helped us to some extent because all the headlines are about um, you know um, you know something um, breaking out and you're isolating a complete uh, ward or complete this thing uh, and and that those pictures are still coming in media barricading etc we should probably talk about why it's not needed and how we can actually uh, you know yeah there could be tech, yeah technology solutions could be there and i guess right. uh, uh, the change in social conduct requires some uh, 
leadership or at least ambassadors or champions of change. Yes. Uh, that, that's, that's a very valid uh, point there. Uh, since one of the concerns, the anxieties that is uh, overwhelming people is economic anxiety, uh, whether they will have a job, what's happening. And so you probably saw the news that Bajaj Auto sold zero motorcycles in April. Purchasing managers index for manufacturing is some, somewhere around 20s. And today I saw a purchasing managers index for services, which is mind boggling 5.4% or something. Uh, a really scary number. Uh, well, whatever is the absolute number which comes through. Uh, the fact is that at, at the economic level, uh, India is going to be hit because of this large informal sector. A lockdown, I mean, the flattening of the curve is also deepening of uh, economic distress, deepening of uh, demand downturn and all, all the things that follow. Uh, every sector you hear of job losses, of pig slips and all. Uh, so a, I, I have two questions on this. A, where do you see this sort of uh, headed do do you do you believe in the alphabet theory which is that the recovery that follows will be a v a u a w a l uh, and uh, the more important question is there is there are a lot of question as to why the india stimulus package is not sort of visible as yet so i wanted you to look at these two spots right so first of all uh, you know um, i firmly believe that um, uh, we may get into multiple occurrence of this virus, recurrence of this virus in the future. Uh, so, for example, right now we are allowing people to move. You know, the migratory labor to move. Mm -hmm. We are allowing people to come from abroad. You know, this week okay. we are bringing people from abroad. Mm -hmm. So, some transmission is going to happen because of all this. And, and every, so everything in India is about scale. I mean, you know, it's the largest evacuation, the largest migrant right. movement. So uh, it is so going to be quite challenging. It, it is to be expected. I think we need to prepare ourselves for this uh, and, and, and go forward with this. Uh, unfortunately, the economy uh, will be uh, hit severely. But I'm optimistic that, uh, you know, this is going to be behind us at some point in the future. Uh, we are going to put this behind us. And we will restart the economy. Uh, everything that was true about the economy before COVID struck, which was that it is a young uh, economy, you know, youth primarily constitutes the majority. Um, consumption is increasing, education levels are going up. Uh, uh, our own uh, um, capabilities are increasing and improving. So everything that we talked about uh, uh, and then if I look at, uh, you know, from 1980, we were a $160 billion economy to today we have become a $2.7 trillion economy. Everything that let us move from there to here is true. Nothing has changed because of this. There has been a temporary blip. So we must have the confidence in us, ourselves. We must have the confidence to rebuild. We must work together as a community to rebuild. And if we do that, we have seen a devastated Japan or a devastated Germany becoming a uh, world power. We have seen India, which was a, a, a $160 billion economy 40 years back, right? 1980, in my lifetime, uh, moved to a $2.7 trillion economy, one of the largest economies in the world. So we must have confidence in ourselves that we will rebuild. And I, I think today's youth believes that it will be, you know, they will rebuild this economy. That's what gives me confidence. So you spoke about Germany and Japan and the rebuilding, reconstruction of this post the World War II. I mean, those were aided by the Marshall Plan. And uh, currently, all governments in the world have put together over $10 trillion. I'm, I mean, you know, the current value uh, estimation is difficult, but uh, on on based on various reports, if you look at it, the the current stimulus package of ten point whatever uh, three trillion dollars 
is multiple times of what the Marshall Plan was uh, in 1948. Right. Uh, we don't see any sign of uh, a Marshall Plan or a stimulus package in India. Uh, and we see quite a lot of contrary statements. We have the uh, Reserve Bank governor saying that we need uh, a fiscal backstop, uh, that the government should step in and then only uh, the RBI can do stuff. And then this morning, the chief economic advisor uh, has said that there, are, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, aside from the political insensitivity of that statement, uh, it, 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 the confusion uh, and uh, it's about the delay and, uh, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be a direct uh, a kind of directional signaling here that this is happening, it will take 10 days or we will wait for lockdown to lift up. Uh, do you see this as sort of impacting companies, employees, uh, worsening yes. anxiety? Yes, uh, you know, uh, at uh, Confederation of Indian Industries, we did a survey of our membership and in the SME sector, small and medium enterprise sector, 25% of companies are already facing bankruptcies. Uh, they have run out of uh, their um, um, cash and uh, they're staring at um, you know, what they will do going forward. Uh, they're paid the salaries in March and April. Now you know, they don't have any wherewithal to go forward. So th this is um, a very difficult situation. I think there is a need for the government to um, put together a stimulus package. Uh, what percentage of the GDP should it be? You know, um, I think we need to work that out. We need to, these are extraordinary times, right? That's how we talk, started the- sure. um, You know, when you mentioned about uh, your survey at CII, uh, Deloitte, the auditing firm, uh, put out a note which said that 27 of the 100 top NSC listed firms, uh, if sales revenues fell by more than 30%, they wouldn't be able to sustain wages. Right. So, so a lot of the small and medium enterprises, and I would dare say smaller uh, individual businesses, will move probably from one form of lockdown to another form of lockdown. I mean, you know, there will be the imposed lockdown, and then there is the implosion lockdown. Uh, this is something that I think, uh, even though the chambers have been sort of talking about it, and th this is a this is a very worrying question mark. It is, and uh, uh, no, um, you know, uh, no confusion about it in my mind that it is it is worrying. So you know, one we can wait uh, for government, and I hope they will come forward sooner than later. But we are trying to do some things on our own in the sense that, you know, for example, uh, startups have put together some funds to take care of employees displaced. We have put together some funds to uh, help uh, startups with um, uh, debt funding, working capital funding. So we need to think about how we can help each other. There are companies who have cash in their balance sheet. Can we create a, a private equity fund, which is more like a development finance fund today. Uh, so they expect lower returns or a social fund, lower returns. This is to help companies uh, manage this, this period. So we need to think about it. And you talked about Marshall Plan. Marshall Plan came from outside these countries, outside Germany and Japan. Mm -hmm. So we need to access some of the uh, global funds that are available outside. Mm -hmm. To manage and uh, and and we need to figure out see unfortunately for india before the covid situation came uh, we had already gone through a banking crisis and nbfc crisis so our financial system uh, is not in the best shape it should be and that has created problems so banks though they're flush with funds they're parking that with rbi is not able to lend um, so there there are challenges um, if we can address them during this downturn, yes, uh, we may we may solve some of the problems, um, but we we have to work together. See, trust is also not there. You know, the banks not uh, lending is a question of trust. So we have to figure out how to uh, how to manage this situation the best that we can, 
and there will be some losses there will be some failures uh, the fear is that tomorrow somebody will question them you know of making mistakes i think we need to send a clear signal saying that you will not be if you have used best faith in making those decisions you will not be questioned i think that clear message must go out so that we can do this so i i wanted to so that you know that the political messaging should sort of uh, come alongside the stimulus package and that's how the stimulus package might work well and i think the point of uh, re reducing hardship of people at different levels is very critical to even the revival of the economy right uh, so i wanted to sort of uh, ask you to put your hat as a technology person and sort of look into the crystal ball as to what the new normal would look like so there's a lot of work from home yesterday martin wolf who's the chief economic editor of the financial times uh, was mentioning that just about six or seven people are at uh, the office and the entire papers they put out uh, by uh, from remote uh, randall stephenson of uh, at&t was one of the first people to sort of ask his entire team to work from home and i i i dare say a lot of indian companies have done the same thing so do you think that this could move into a new level i mean you know work from home could become a new norm and this they could be having uh, this could have implications on different sectors but before that uh, as one of the founders of uh, infosys and somebody who knows the service sector in india is growing on services more than any other sector uh, do you see the pandemic impacting the growth of the services sector outsourcing of services in technology and other areas uh, you know there is already already stories about lower remittances lower exports lower uh, engagement uh, how do companies like say technology companies and uh, infosys or tcs or wipro or even tech mahindra and others how do they operate in when the flights are down with social distancing travel will will obviously get much more difficult so two parts one uh, what what happens to the uh, services area technology uh, exports that the services exports that we do uh, do you see this going into a new area uh, and what's the new normal that you see uh, post pandemic so the it services sector uh, will get impacted because their clients are impacted you know they work with uh, the global 2000 companies the largest companies in the world and uh, every one of them uh, is uh, facing uh, decline in revenues uh, especially if you are in the area of uh, travel hospitality uh you know me uh, to some extent uh, restaurant yeah. business to uh, etc uh, and 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 that will get transmitted to the it industry it services industry and they will see decline in revenues but what i have experienced in the past um, you know to for example the financial crisis of 2008 um the best thing about uh, the relationship is the relationship is very sticky they have done uh, an excellent job of servicing these clients the customers are very loyal and when things start picking up we will see revenues going up for these companies these companies are zero debt companies they have huge cash balances they will be able to manage this downturn much better than i believe any other industry sector uh, they have very loyal clients and you know and they have very deep pockets and financially strong the leadership is also uh, very experienced in managing crisis and they will be able to manage this to your second question on how life is going to change uh, yeah, sorry sorry to uh, I, i thought of something else i mean you know do you, there's a lot of talk about deglobalization regionalization do you see that affecting services uh, of IT, the it services area do you see uh, american companies sourcing services in america european companies sourcing com uh, services in europe and shrinking the world at if i may say so uh, not uh, really because uh, this is a question of availability of talent 
and uh, um, you know if you look at uh, us if you look at europe uh, they are all aging societies less number of people are going for technical education and uh, you know more towards liberal arts and things like that hence uh, they don't have the the number of people required to um, you know serve the demand for technology mm -hmm. and the technology demand for technology is only going up rather than mm -hmm. going down uh, and as we transition and and that's the second part of the question that you asked mm -hmm. transitioning much faster than ever before to become a digital society true you know, every aspect of our life even family interactions you know it used to be just whatsapp but now family interactions are actually on video now right every aspect of our life is becoming digital we are ordering um, grocery you know because that has the, become the normal because we can't go out and shop so every aspect of our life is becoming digital all payments are becoming digital everything and 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 that means every business will have to continue to spend on this transition will have to continue to spend on technology and this will accelerate even sectors that didn't do this for example healthcare telemedicine has become the norm electronic medical records will become the norm because that's the only way you can actually make sure that all the people involved are on the same page and is able to service the patients so this transition will require significant invest in technology and 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 that's the reason why i think the it industry will see growth in the future uh, except for the downturn and we will as as individuals as um, society we will uh, definitely move to the new normal when i talk to startups less than 30 employees less than 20 employees they say we don't need an office in the future we work as yeah. well and our yeah. productivity yeah. is better because they say we are not commuting we don't have uh um, you know the need to fly just for one meeting so you know to think about just this normally you would have said i'll come to delhi or bombay let's do a face to face interview you know we are much more productive you know you just woke up ate your breakfast and came you know i just joined you from here in the evening and and we will go on to do the next thing after this sir our productivity so, is actually so, much better so so the world uh, as we live in uh, was defined as before christ and anno domini which is after christ uh, what would the world so the world is looking like before corona and after corona uh, so what what are your top 3 sort of crystal gaze uh, ideas after corona more work from home more uh, online education more telemedicine yes uh, clearly and uh, you know there was a very interesting uh, comment i saw today you know the for uh, colleges the biggest challenge they face is right now they need to do online education to survive but they can't allow people to get used to online education because then the rationale for a, a physical college will actually go out of the window because people will get used to doing mm -hmm. online education so there were a catch 22 situation right now so that's the dilemma i think we will see a lot of colleges closing uh, we will see uh, many you know types of work changing as we go along institutions changing as we go forward and uh, hopefully less commute and less air travel and things to that pollution levels coming down we address the issue of climate change and things like just cleanliness you know in a country like india the the need for cleanliness suddenly has become center stage right so i hope that uh, you know some of these changes are changes for good and uh, we must embrace them and we must make them into um, permanent changes the the old philosophers used to say that the only way to maintain status quo is to embrace change and so on that hopeful and optimistic note uh, krish thank you very much we thank you for having a, me a, a excellent uh, interaction uh, i will just look if there were any questions uh, okay i i see a couple of questions which i thought we should take okay. up before we sort of uh, some uh, one of the 
people who is logged into the webinar wanted wants to know whether India should uh, if, whether the way to go is FDI. Uh, we sort of open up because this there might be changes in the supply chain, uh, de-risking of supply chain from China. I mean we we, we have till now sort of looked at. Uh, we thought that we have a global supply chain, but actually it was a Chinese supply chain. Uh, so, so that is changing. So, so not, what, what can India do more? Yeah. So these are two separate things, actually. One, we need to build resilience in our um, uh, economy. We need to make sure that critical parts of the supply chain are available locally uh, so that disruptions don't happen. We need to diversify our dependence uh, from a country perspective, such that again, we don't create um, you know, single point failures and things like that. So the resilience, building resilience in the supply chain is extremely important. And the second part is for FDI. Uh, I think we need to uh, be the best in attracting investments, best place, uh, because investments will allow us to um, improve our governance processes, uh, we become more competitive. So I see the ability to attract um, investments as part of India becoming competitive in every aspect. We must be able to attract the best people to come and live and work and learn from India. We need to be attract the best investments from outside so that our capital utilization becomes very efficient. So these are these are actually aspects of making the economy competitive as a country becoming more competitive. And that's how I see it. So there are a couple of more questions, very interesting ones. So one is there is a proposal in, uh, being considered in government that about uh, how to raise money for uh, the stimulus package. And one idea is that uh, public sector shares uh, of listed public sector entities should be pledged to the Reserve Bank of India and money uh, raised. Uh, is that a good idea? I mean, you know, the Reserve Bank so, of India, finally the uh, regulator of banking system buying shares, uh, it, it sounds a little... Right, corporate bonds may be okay uh, or through a mechanism to buy corporate bonds is okay. Uh, but um, uh, when I look at uh, raising funds, I would actually look at um, the public holding. See, whether the government holds equity or the public holds equity, I consider it as very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, right in a democracy, government represents people. If people hold the equity, it's similar. So I would actually suggest that um, our public sector undertakings become a lot more publicly held. Uh, and government shares come down and it will also bring uh, and create a strong board. So better accountability in these uh, public sector undertakings. Uh, another question that has come up is that, uh, would the downturn and the shock to the economy scare away entrepreneurship? That is something I worry about. Uh, if let's say uh, a large number of startups end up failing uh, we will have a generation, which is, you know, maybe five years, 10 years of people worried about doing a startup, worried about joining a startup, etc. I don't want that to happen. And in fact, I would prioritize actually helping startups in this uh, time so that, um, you know, we, we support and support as many startups to survive. Personally, when I look at my philanthropy, I've directed part of my philanthropy to supporting startups. I consider that as a philanthropy during this mm -hmm. downturn mm -hmm. so that we can ensure that, you know, we are the third largest ecosystem for startups. We need that to create an innovation led economy. We need that to create an economy that reacts with speed because startups, you know, do things at speed and we can't lose that. Students were actually going to startups, starting businesses, etc. We must sustain that. Just uh, one final question before uh, and the, uh, the ways to fund entrepreneurship, the ways to fund businesses uh, may change. Uh, I suspect that uh, 
in a large number of countries where the government is bailing out companies they might the government might it might become like joint ventures or joint stock companies uh, in areas where philanthropic groups such as yours are helping out startups those ownership structures may change do you see the the way the design of a company uh, the firm as we say uh, changing in the days to come because of the exigencies of funding of exigencies of who holds equity uh, is there is there something that you see there um not really uh, with a with a slight uh, modification see one interesting experiment that happened in india is this creation of the uh, india stack for financial services uh, it was created through a public private partnership run by primarily by volunteers Mm -hmm. and the platform is actually a public good on top of that now we have payment gateways and things like that all the banks are linked to it and 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 the result of that is today we have i believe one of the best and one of the lowest cost financial uh, infrastructure in the world absolutely absolutely i think right? npci is world class the, so uh, right so that is a model that we can take forward uh that's the model we are actually trying now in healthcare to create a a platform on which healthcare services can actually be bolted on and um, and citizens will have choice see we we need to create the most efficient that means competition must be there but we also want to create the lowest cost uh services and 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 that can only happen if we use a uniquely india model uh for things like healthcare if you look at us healthcare for example very expensive unaffordable for most people even in the us and still not giving you the results that you require you know the results are not good so we need to look at newer models and that's what i believe uh, as an you know example we've got from the uh, telecom we've got the best telecom infrastructure the lowest cost now we have got the financial se- sector uh infrastructure at the lowest possible cost i think we need to look at these models uh there's another question somebody young obviously is wants to know whether there is uh, how do you see what's happening to the shared economy the gig economy uh social distancing might uh, threaten the future of say uber ola uh, airbnb oyo these kind of uh, things is that a temporary fear or do you think that it's a yeah so we, so we don't know you know how this is all going to play out in the future and how uh, you know what will survive what will not survive everybody will have to figure out how to uh, pivot uh, as individuals as companies as uh, we we experience new things you know is it that going to be a permanent change or not um, so that need to pivot the need to adapt is what is important you know i i strongly feel that our response to covid crisis is about learning to adapt and learning to adapt faster than before with speed and if we are able to do that we will survive and businesses also will survive true my first book called accidental india premised that crisis is a feel good factor that crisis drives change and i think that we are on the cusp of a crisis and hopefully we will see change that makes india uh, better and the world a more interesting place to live in thank you very much chris thank you very much thanks sagar for having me and thank you to everyone who logged in thank you bye